Hello. Hi guys. Oh, Lisa's coming in now. Hi. All right, just give it another minute and Lisa, hi. Hi. You're here. I told you I wouldn't make you wait too long. That was rapid speed. I didn't even get to do the intros at all. Well, oh, well then I went too fast. Bye no, only. that's, that's Go great. It's perfect timing. <laughs> Um, well, great. Now that we have you here, we can go ahead and do a quick intro. Um, first of all, I'm Daniela. I'm a member at Spoke, and I'm obviously a design lover, and I'm so excited to talk to you about all things portfolio, and there's so much to cover here, so I just, I feel like this is going to be really fun. Yes, I know. We've, we've talked about this a, a good amount, and I think it's an important conversation for all emerging designers and current designers. I mean, this is something I'm always learning about too, um, how to present yourself and your, and your work and who you are aesthetically. Um, it's, it's intricate, but it's not um, something that I don't think we can't tackle right now. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, I also, I feel like this, whenever talking about portfolios comes up, everyone wants to dive into client stuff, which is like a natural, you know, totally. um, but I wanted to do like a little caveat just to let everyone who's watching know that we hear you. There's so much stuff to cover with clients, but we're going to probably, we're going to do a part two and dive into that piece of it a little bit more, um, after. So for this session, we're going to be focusing, you know, all things portfolio and how to basically start up your portfolio so you can then get the clients that you want to get. Exactly. I think that's, that's a great point because I think it's, it's easy to put the cart before the horse with how do we get those clients or like yeah. how, do, how, how will clients respond to this? But we have to like bring it back, talk about like the foundation level of a portfolio first. And then, like you said, we'll, we'll dive into that in our next session or at a later date. Yeah, totally. Um, cool. Well, I mean, I have a bunch of questions. I would love to just get started. And of course, if anyone's not familiar with Spoke Sessions, this is our monthly live chat with industry experts about all things design, branding, obviously portfolios. So um, tune in. We have these every month. And um, we'll go ahead and get started with the portfolio stuff. Um, so I have a personal question for you, which is what... I mean, when you're just getting started, like let's say you're just getting started and you have no idea, you feel like you have nowhere nowhere to start, what's the first step into building your portfolio? Um, I think we've talked about this a little bit. I think, you know, it's it's intimidating, right? Because you're thinking long, like, like you just said about clients, you're thinking long term, you're thinking about like, I don't have any clients or I have a few clients, how do I get more? And, you know, I, I the way that I would start this is by really bringing it back um, to, to basics here and thinking about what is your brand? Like, who are you? Um, yeah. and how do you establish that? And because that is what's, that's what's going to feed the content of your portfolio, whether it's a website or an Instagram or a, you know, a spoke portfolio. I think it depends on who you are individually. You can have all of them. You could have one of them. And my first bit of advice here to not be to skimp on quality branding. And what I mean by that is try to really understand who you are aesthetically, what your goals are, um, what you are drawn to, what kind of projects that you like. And um, maybe get clear on that from like a vocabulary standpoint, like what are the, what are the five, 10 words that describe my style? What are the five, 10 words that describe me? And what are the inspiration images? If I once you know once you figure out those words, what what images could, do, would you attach to those those words, those traits? And from there, you know, this is assuming you don't have any projects to, to photograph or anything like that. Just really starting very simply here. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that I think that one could figure out how to figure out what those words are and what a mood board would look like to to, to embody those those characteristics would be to probably get 
comfortable with something like these book school or play around with viz which if you're not familiar with that those are all um offerings that are within spoke um that can help you really hone in on these elements of like who i am as a designer who i am aesthetically and from there um that is going to give you like that that foundation of like what this brand is and like who am i representing um i know that you and i kind of talked about this a little bit when it kind of, when it came to, like mood boards specifically and like how do you embody yourself in a mood board like how do you describe yourself and i think that when like when we were talking about this like a couple days ago it sounded like you would kind of play around with mood boards a little bit and like sit with them and come back to them and be like what resonates with me now and what doesn't and understand like what your filter is when you're designing is that am i right yeah yeah and i think like I mean, so much of what you're saying, right, with like the branding and the mood boards, like, yeah. it's all in bespoke school, right? So like, this has been so helpful for me as somebody who's trying to get started as, you know, a designer. And um, it's just been really helpful. But the mood board piece, for sure, like we, we have this tool viz where you can create not only actual mock ups of, you know, like a room you're working on, but you can also create these you know, more editorial, like mood board pieces that give you an idea of, you know, a project that you're creating. Like for me, that's like the first step to getting anything off the ground running, right? Like you right. want to start off and like, figure out like, okay, what's, what's this gonna look like, whether it's my own branding or a project, it's like, what is the focus of this? Like, what do we want it to feel like? What imagery reminds me of what I want this to you know, evoke. And I 100% agree that like mood boarding is so important with figuring out your own style and aesthetic. And you know, just, it's great. It's like, I, I recommend it for any anything really. Yeah. And I think on that point, it, it's, I think, maybe not talked about enough that designers, whether established or, you know, emerging or, or centers for like, doing design as like a side hustle i don't think that it's you know it's it's fairly common that they do not um post all of like their work on their portfolio like the portfolio is not necessarily like these these you know perfectly styled like photographs that you would see on pinterest or in, in design magazines like a lot of portfolio can be you know self-expression via mood board and imagery like this is who i am these are things that resonate with me these are things that help describe who i am because at the end of the day i think we should maybe go back and define like what a portfolio is its purpose is like the the vehicle mm -hmm. the per the vehicle of portfolio is basically to express to anybody outside of you know your realms totally new prospects who you are as a designer and, and express quite literally what you will bring to the table for them and you know whether that and, that and that goes through so many things too that goes through typography that goes through color palette and choices and animation on your on your instagram on your portfolio in like in your portfolio how do you express um yourself through all of these different all of these different lenses and i think that one thing that we should talk about too is you know before and while you're establishing these mood boards and th those vocabulary words to describe yourself and your design, you know, thinking about the little details, like what font am I using? What color choices am I making? Um, mm -hmm. Am I am I using something that's like really curvy and funky, or am I using yeah. a little cleaner, a little bit more Art Deco? And and that usually lends itself to the type of person who is going to respond to that too. So in these small ways to express yourself, it also is going to ultimately resonate with somebody, um, a prospective client. I know we're not using that word yet. So I know, yeah. it's going to resonate with somebody to say, oh, like Daniela's work, that I, I really love that. These are really interesting like images. This is a really interesting choice of font. And I love that she chose, I don't know, like, you know, maroon or you yeah. know, like this deep green because those are, those are colors that I love to see in spaces. So those types of choices, you know, staying true to yourself in that respect, I think helps bring the, the right people to you um, because you want at the end of the day, people to align with you. Um, and that's why being true to yourself and being really authentic with how you're branding yourself is essential. Yeah. Um, 
And, yeah. and the one thing I, I do want to add to, because I have been intricately involved in developing Bespoke School, is we have two goals, um, the Put Yourself Out There and Define Your Style course. I was um, just going to bring that up, yeah. <laughs> I think you've taken. Yes, right? yeah. I have taken those courses, and they are super helpful. I mean, without giving like too much away, I just think that's such a great starting point. If you feel like you don't know what your aesthetic is or what your style is right. for me, I know I love color and I, I mean, I'm, I could get real weird. So for me, it's like, how, how do I like put it all together and keep it cohesive? Yeah. And I think it's, it's really helpful to just see not only, you know, what is taught in that regard and spoke school, but the spoke school, but also putting it to practice because there's like the courses and then there's the practice piece where you can, it's like a test for you. Like, yeah, what you, exactly. like it's your homework, like, you know, put it, put it to work and see how it comes together. But yeah. Um, I, I was going to say something and now I'm losing it, but, oh, okay. <laughs> I was, I was just going to mention like, cause you're talking about like portfolio. I feel like there's like, there's portfolio and then there's also like other elements like social media and you know your website and that like typography all that stuff is like part of it so can we just talk about like yeah. social media and how to how to use it to your advantage and like to me it feels like a whole package right like it's like everything put together but I'd love to just hear your perspective on like branding okay. on like online of course. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a, a great point to bring up because I think once you get through that foundation of who I am, who, like, what is this brand that I'm creating? Like, how do I express myself aesthetically and through all these other little details like color and typography, as I mentioned, the next step is, and I think this is, this is a, a very um, new thing for me even. I mean, I've only been, I've only had my business now for almost five years, only, but for about five years. I was like, that's a long time. <laughs> it's a long time. It's a long time. Um, but I, in the beginning, you know, Instagram and a social presence was not weighed as heavily as it is now. So, and I, I, I preface this with, I'm still learning, you know? So I think that all of these, these, these notes that I'm giving are not a one size fits all approach. Cause I think people are at a different point, no matter inherently in their, yeah. in their career and their goals in the, in the world of design that, this might not be something that resonates with everybody, but I will say that I have found personally that presence, you know, a blog, your presence with the blog, with social media accounts, whether that's Instagram, if that's, you know, Pinterest, if that's a Twitter account, um, how, you know, Facebook page, of course, but how you express yourself there too. So like once you're confident and comfortable with like who this brand is, how, what's the next step? How do you apply it? How do you garner an audience? within that, within that um, sphere that, of, that you feel comfortable and, and where, how do you take it to the next step? Like, cause, cause marketability I think is essential. Um, and I don't think that there's necessarily a prescription to, you, know, you must post this much stuff. You must show mood boards. I think using that as an outlet to express yourself and to maybe start conversation or to get, you know, some sort of attention from even, you know, your friends to say, yeah. Hey, I love that. You know, where did you find that? And, and it will help inspire you too. And I think there's so many ways to offer inspiration on your, on a blog, on social media and whatnot that, you know, creating things like product roundups of things that you like, showing people how you source, you can show mood boards of figurative projects. And I think that that's essential too. Like maybe, especially in viz in, in, um, and spoke, you know, you maybe don't have a current project that you're working on, but a way to show how you would a approach a, a, a project would be like, okay, what do I want? Like my Malibu Barbie yeah. house or, you know, some like, you know, pied-a-terre in Paris, like some, some imaginative project that resonates with you. And then you, you kind of play it out. Like what would the mood board for this project be? You know, what type of furniture pieces would I select? What are the paint options that I would, that I would sift through? And you can make these figurative projects or, you know, these imaginative projects for practice for yourself, but also to create a, like not a, not a literal story on Instagram, but it could be, but to create a narrative on online and yeah 
use that to build content and because a portfolio in so many ways is content right it's it's whatever content you want it to be and i think that this is a great way to create content and create expression and to develop a brand and a presence without necessarily having those projects that you will have eventually um yeah. so yeah. and it's like we're yeah. we're kind of oh, sorry what were you saying no i was just gonna say we're i feel like as you creatives and as people who love design we're kind of already doing that you know like at least for me i'm on instagram i'm saving photos that i love i'm saving products that i love like for my own like yeah information you know but that's i i actually you mentioned product roundups and i feel like this was a thing that i tried which you know blogging is just really hard and time consuming but i um just love putting together like a, a roster of things that I've seen recently that are inspiring me or products that I might not necessarily need right now, but I could use them for a project down the line and just kind of getting in the habit of like creating whether, you know, it doesn't have to be for a client, you know, like it's, it's for yourself. And I think it's all practice to, to build up your own style and yeah. And someone's bringing up thingology, like we're constantly thingology and spoke is, you know, it's great. I mean, there's, we have a feed now where we can see all these products that people are sourcing, like color palettes. Um, they're, we're always sharing things that are inspiring us. And I think that's the, for me, like, that's what I try to continue doing because, you know, you want to stay inspired and you want to keep finding those things. And it doesn't always have to be tied to a client or a gig, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I, you know, I, and I think that social media too, just bringing it back to that can be somewhat intimidating. You know, it, it, you feel like you have to be so, I mean, I, I don't feel, I don't feel this way, but I feel like it's often that it comes up that you feel like, you know, whatever you put on there needs to be perfectly tailored and perfectly curated. And I think that there is something nice about expressing and creating content around a project or items that you like without it being tied down to a client specifically. Yeah. I think um, it also, I see someone here saying that it, it helps you stay inspired in collecting inspiration. Exactly. Like inspiration is, you know, is going to keep, you know, collecting this, sifting through it, um, posting it is going to keep you inspired in this process because it, it's, very real that when you know there's a lull in you know work or you know you're you're working hard to establish who this who you are as a designer what this portfolio looks like it's important to stay inspired and so that you know it's it's mo like very beneficial in many ways to both creating content and keeping you inspired i think that's a great point there and on the social media front you know there we have a goal um in bespoke school that helps you understand the ins and outs and, you know, kind of major pro tips in the world of design as it relates yeah. to social media that I highly recommend. I mean, I take it because it's like, I, I'm like, the, not the best when it comes to it because, you know, it, it's at social media. Yeah. I'm oh, I feel like you're there. good. I feel like you're good. I yeah. Know. But it's, but that's exactly it. Like I'm constantly in my own head, like, did I edit that? Like what, you know, like, is this even worth posting? But then like, I haven't posted. It's really hard to, to get out of that mindset. But I think that's like, that's just like the whole point. You have to just move past it and, and just, you know, keep on posting. But I know we did get a question in the chat um, just not too long ago about um, whether or not what we're saying is recommending going to school, getting a degree or taking bespoke school. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I mean, Lisa, I feel like we can both answer this one, but I I feel like there are several things that you can do that don't require getting a formal degree, right? right. And edu yes. in um, interior design, but there are resources like Bespoke, Bespoke School that are super helpful and and mm -hmm. yeah, and also all these things that we're talking about already, like these are things that we can all be doing to to build up portfolios. Exactly. I think I mean a formal education or not is a personal choice. Um, we've talked about this, I think, many times in many different sessions. And, it, you know, it's obviously a very um, important question. We get it a lot, but it's it's a personal choice. I think it depends on what your long-term 
goals are, you know, obviously there's a financial component to going to get a formal education, but I, I will be the first to tell you that with having a formal education, it is not essential um, to be successful in the design world. Yes, they're, they're like, just like anything, there's a pros and cons, um, but it would be hard for me to say that there are not options outside of formal education. You know, Bespoke School, you know, Hila and I, the, the co-founder of Spoke, created the content and the courses in there for this exact reason. Um, you know, really giving a real, real world education within the world of design, um, as opposed to all of the coursework that one would take in a formal education program that may or may not be applied in real life, um, which is why, you know, for me, it was so essential to bring this to Spoke. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to say don't do it, and I'm not going to say yeah. you could do it. Um, but, but it's nice to know that there's options, you there's know? So like options, yes. Yeah. I think also school is like, I mean, more power to anyone do it, you know? Like, I, I, for me personally, like, it didn't, it doesn't make sense for my situation right now. And yeah, absolutely. It's, it's totally a personal choice based on where you are, what, you know, what your finances are, what you want to be doing for the next like right. portion of your life. So, I mean, when I found Spoke, I was just kind of like, what? like for me, it was a big eye-opening experience truly because I was just like, oh, there's something else out there that can still teach me the things I want to learn, but I don't have to dedicate the next like four years in my entire bank account to. I say, and you're well, like yeah. And I think, you know, bringing this back to port this, this point here, back to portfolios, I definitely would can, can confirm that you do not need a formal education to create a portfolio um, that will, you know, long-term bring you clients, you know, like, and that's why I think going back to the basics here of like, just figuring out who you are, there's so many resources and tools at our fingertips. I mean, obviously spoke has like all of them but um you know outside of that people still source on pinterest and generally just like google you know there are so many resources that we have that we can create an identity and a portfolio and garner clients without saying like you know ba or mfa from a certain school um so i think that that is important to remind people who may be hesitant to start out on this journey because it feels intimidating. Um, you know, it's, there's so many resources within Spoke, within the community of Spoke that I think we could help build your confidence there. But um, the portfolio component is an essential one. And I think it will help you create confidence within yourself and be able to understand what your aesthetic is and gives you the practice on social media as we we're just talking about. And I think that the, the next part here that we haven't discussed that I would like to talk about, which you know is supplementary to all of this, is the photography element. Because I know, oh, yes. <laughs> so I know, when, you, know you go on any designer's website, you go on a designer's Instagram account that maybe you follow, you admire, whatnot, there's a lot of photography on there. And there's a lot of like, really nice you looking know. images. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, your inspiration images typically look like those portfolio images, you know? So that is another factor that I think can feel intimidating. But what I want to say to, to really um, hopefully shed some light on how this process even starts is if you don't have a project or you don't have something that you want to photograph, um, I think it's okay okay to photograph your home like I think you should photograph your home I think it yeah it shows who you are and I also think that it's an easy layup for a project for you to put on your um on your website on your Instagram on your spoke portfolio and the way that you can do this is you know on, literally like iPhone photos and um editing them you know in an app on your phone, if at all, or just bring, or, you know, making sure it's the right lighting for the right time of day. Because if it's not, if it, I see, we have a comment here yeah. about a friend's place. Yes, exactly. Um, this was something we were gonna get to. Yes. That you do not need to, 
it doesn't have to be your space. And one thing that I was going to suggest, if you don't feel comfortable doing your space or you, you don't think it's ready for that, maybe, you know, talk to a friend, talk to a family member and say, hey, can I, you like, I really love this part of your home or your entire home. And I would love to style it or stage it in some way, you know, move furniture around, bring in additional props, bring in accessories. Maybe they're yours. Maybe you, you return them from a friend later um, and set it up and, and photograph it. And sure, that won't be, you know, the full encompassing design maybe that you wanted to, but it, it shows how you utilize an existing space and style it. And then, and then you can create a whole narrative around that um, and talk about your process and talk about, hey, I went into my friend Daniela's home and she really wanted me, she like, you know, she allowed me to, you know, restyle what was there and talk about that process, document that process, create that content and help build confidence both for yourself as a designer and that also, you know, when you do get that project um, that you've been seeking, you'll have that confidence of like, oh, I've done this before. I know how yeah. this goes. I know what to do next. I. Um, you know, you, you, you'll feel a little bit more comfortable in that environment. And then an, another side bit to that is, you know, if you do bring in accessories or you bring in some sort of, you know, additional furniture or something for these, for these photos, you can all, you can, you know, tag where you got the brand pieces they're... from, or, you know, talk to your local, I don't know, like antique store or a vendor that you really like in your neighborhood and say, Hey, I want to do this. Do you, can I take these pieces out on loan? Like every, I mean, every shop is different. Um, you know, there's probably a loan agreement that you'd have to sign, but that's an option too. And then you can kind of cross promote and, you know, mm -hmm. utilize new things and show how you can accessorize and style within you know, within things that are within your grasp. And then you also build relationships that way. I mean, I think there's just so many layers that one could possibly add on to this process um, that maybe not, that may not be, excuse me, the, the initial thought that you would have when it's like, oh, I need to photograph something. Let me move some stuff around. Let me declutter yeah. the photo. It's like, yes, of course, but let's also layer on and like really think about how the design process works within projects within our grasp. Um, yeah, but I think I always think about like my own apartment. I feel like that's like my personal playground. Like that's my space to have fun with my design. That's my space to experiment with styling. And I, I totally agree. I think like a lot of the photos that I'm sharing on my own Instagram is really just like my home and how I'm having fun, like moving things around or like this crazy wall that I painted and I love that wall. <laughs> so many walls. Yeah. It's, it really is just like, to me, like, this is me personally, but I feel like I just try and keep having fun with it. And if I, cause otherwise I get too stuck in my head about like, okay, this is, you know, like it, it should never feel like not a fun process. Like this is <laughs> you creating your own space and it's like practice for yourself and it is such a good way to um, build relationships with other people like even you know friends like you were saying but businesses too like I've definitely um, tried reaching out to some folks to see if there's like any way to cross collaborate like people are really friendly and you'd be surprised yeah. how open some businesses will be to working with you on some stuff like that and people like to see like you working hard, you know, like it's cool when you see someone creating something that they love and just going for it. Like it really is inspiring. So I, I agree. I think like just keep on taking the photos in your place and asking people and really just like push to, to keep taking all of that stuff. But, and, uh, you can, and, and that allows you to really have control and, and an ability to communicate your aesthetic. Yeah. Whether it's, you know, documented in, in a video where you're literally talking to me through the process or multiple like before and after photos, um, that content builds a portfolio, you know, that is, and you have complete control over the aesthetic, which is, which is great because that is what you, what one would have on their portfolio long term, you would have, you know, it finished images of a project where it was your design. So finding a way to do that without having that project on hand, I think is, is important. And then, you know, the, the obvious part of this that we haven't yet addressed is of course, the photography itself. Yeah. yeah. So many questions about this. So, um, 
we have this really great course in Bespoke School about taking photos with your yeah. iPhone, which is yeah. really helpful because, you know, that is an option and that's realistically what most of us are doing. But I like, how do you know when you should invest in a professional photographer? Is it even necessary? Like what, I don't know. What is, what do you recommend for that question? And I, I personally struggle with this sometimes too, because I'm not a photographer, but you know, hiring a professional photographer, you know, is it, can be expensive. You know, it's, it's an expense. Let's just put it that way. And it, I think it depends on the project. It depends on your budget. And I think, you know, we are looking into and probably teaser here going to bring a course to bespoke school on this exact topic on, on professional photography and interiors for photo interior photography um, outside of your iPhone you know, for hiring somebody. And it's, it's a person, of course, like anything, it's a personal decision. Um, but I will say that I don't think it is necessary in the beginning stages of developing a portfolio to hire a, a professional interior designer or excuse me, a professional interior photographer. Sure. Um, and that is because typically you want to reserve that for the projects down the road that can, you know, push you to the next level. Right now, if you have limited resources or any resources, I would not advise that it's spending the money on a photographer in the beginning phases is the best thing to do. Um, and that's because there are so many things that you can do before you spend that money. You can take, yeah. the, take the iPhone um, photography course from Bespoke School. You can play around with various different, you know, free applications that you can download to your phone to edit your own photos. Um, That's, I feel like presets are so helpful with that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and I think that once you kind of understand how photography works in interiors, because it's very different than like taking a photo of your friends or your dog, you know, it's, you know, it's, has, it's about the lighting and it's about the angles and, I think learning that for yourself initially, like via trial and error is, is like a, a key first step. So I don't want to talk too much about professional yeah. yet, but you know, there's a time and a place and there's an, there's a value there. Um, but I think in this beginning phase, while you're learning all of, all of the things design and building out a portfolio, you know, the photos from your iPhone are sufficient enough. They real or or whatever, you know, smartphone that you have. Um, or your own, you know, personal camera. I think being the photographer in the beginning phases is is okay. Not only is it okay, I think it's essential. It's, it it really teaches you something. It's a it's another form of design application um that one only learns through trial and error. Like I don't think I'm the best interior photographer by any means. Like I know what angles I like, but yeah. I don't, I, you know, I don't think I execute perfectly enough, but I just, you know, I keep practicing and I keep trying. And I think that as far as that's concerned, while you're doing this for yourself, give it, make it your homework while you're in space. Like when you're in a space that you really like, like, let's say you walk into a coffee shop and you're like, oh my gosh, this wall is so cute. Take a photo. Yeah. The whole thing looks good. Like feel like put yourself like make yourself feel a little weird like get down like figure out that angle like move something around chances are yeah. no one there's gonna really care yeah. um i be like what okay <laughs> that. and then be like oh this is a really good image and then question yourself why does this image look so good is it the lighting is it the angle is it the the height of the camera like play with that because those are the those are the elements that make these images that you'll put on your portfolio feel a little bit more elevated than just like like the quick photo yeah. on, on your iPhone. That I mean, that's, I agree. Not, I mean, I'm not a photographer, but those are things as a designer that I've played with and I, I have been able to find like what works. Yeah. I, I wish it was as easy as taking a photo of my dog. Like it's, it just doesn't work like that. Right. Like you got, you really do. Someone mentioned getting weird. Like I yes. think, and angle wise too, it's really like, it just depends on the space, you know, like it could be, that you could be in a completely different place, use the same angle and it doesn't work. And I think like, I don't know, simple things like moving things around, like you mentioned, or like moving like a table further away from a couch, like even if it's not realistically where it would be like in the photo, maybe it looks better, you know? So just play with it. Like totally. Around. And that's, yeah. and that's the 
interesting thing too, like the optics of photography are like so not what you think they are. Like the reality of some of these photos, like when this when the coffee table is exactly where you'd want it to be in reality, playing with photography and like being like, no, this doesn't look right. I have to pull it twelve inches to the other side. It's like yeah. who knew that, that was the case? And that's I usually what what happens in these inspiration images that we see all over the place um, that make up our mood boards is those are styled photos. And I think that that's an element of making the perception of the interior as it is in person feel the same way in, in a photograph. And that's a lesson that I'm still learning. But I, um, but it's like I see some, asked, do I recommend getting an iPhone tripod? Yeah, like that I think would definitely help because it will steady your hand. They're not expensive. You could get one on, you know, any online, Amazon yeah. situation and that will steady your hand it'll yeah. allow you to look the camera and that's a quick tip and I think I think that's even mentioned spoiler alert in um <laughs> of course but you'll learn I, I highly yeah. recommend taking that because I, that is something that is key to the portfolio build out from the ground up um and then what about videos TikTok reels using the uh, all of it. Like, if that's something that you feel comfortable with, <laughs> like, by all Go means. For it. Like, I think if you can do it, but but I don't want to say less is more in this sense. Like, don't just put it everywhere so it can be everywhere. If you're going to, like, everything that you put up should be a representation of you and your style and your attention to detail, um, all of the things, um, whether it is you know, I'm going to TikTok or do a, do, do a whole like series on, you know, styling a, a coffee table. Um, yeah. That is are you just be really thoughtful about it. I just think you want quality no matter where it goes. And it needs to be a true self-expression. I don't think you should just post content everywhere for the sake of it. Um, I think that just goes through everything really. Um, yeah. But I would definitely focus on um, quality over quantity. But if you feel comfortable with videos, if you feel comfortable with TikTok, if you feel comfortable with stories or posts, whatever it may be, um, stay there, you know, hone in on that because that's going, that shows who you are. And you, the goal here is, is to get clients to respond to something that they resonate with. So if somebody's like, Hey, I found you on TikTok. That's great. You know, they're on TikTok now. Like you're, yeah. you're, you're you know, getting information about them and what they respond to off the bat. Um, so stay true to yourself. I, I know I say that all the time, but stay true to yourself with how you, how you present yourself, you know, aesthetically on social media, in these, in, in your inspiration images, in the images that you take of your home or a friend's home. Um, just be really, yeah, honest about who, who you are, because I think that inevitably that brings the people to you that appreciate what you're doing. Um, and it no longer becomes a fight. You don't have to really explain yourself this as much because you'll have all of these images that say, Hey, this is, this is who Daniela is. This is who Lisa is, you know, take it or leave it. And that's okay. Um, yeah. So it's, um, on that, on that note, I feel like we have sale. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, we have this question um, that we got a little bit ago about whether or not we need IRL photos in our portfolio or are Vizies just enough, which Vizies are, um, for anyone who's not in the spoke world, it's just like mock-ups of, you know, rooms that you're creating. But I think this kind of answer, like we just talked about this a little bit, like the more, as long as it's, you know, good quality and it represents your brand, like by all means included in your portfolio, right? Like you just want things that represent who you are as a designer and what your aesthetic is. And of course, if you have projects that you're working on, like, please put those in there, right? Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, the, the images of like your home don't have to necessarily be your home. They could be your visies. They could be, um, in, in fact, I think I, I recommend that. I think it shows how you mm -hmm. can execute a design process, you know, showing your busy to say maybe the before and the after, like you busy your home and then you show the after. Like I yeah, think that there's love a love before of, and after. 
Yeah, everyone loves a good before and after. But I think busy is essential. I think mood boards, essential. Color palettes, essential. Showing like products, like like from like thingology, like products that you like. Just there's so many facets to interior design in a successful project that instantly one project is going to give you a ton of content. So maybe you start with like the mood board and you show the mood board and then you show the color palette or the color palette before the mood board, whatever feels better. Yeah. You show the busy, you show the, you know, and then, and then if it's a real, if it's a realized project, you show the photos that you, that you've taken yourself. Um, but you do not need to just show real life photos. Yeah. From There's more options. Yeah. There's many more options. And, and that's why, again, this is not a one size fits all. It's like, what makes sense to you? Maybe your entire portfolio is color palettes. Like, cool. Like, yeah. You know? Like yeah. You gotta you know, know. And maybe it's all visits. Maybe it's all, you know, photos of specific little details of your house. Um, I yeah. think there's, there's no one right way, but um, there are a ton of options. Yeah. Agreed. Um, I see there's a question here. I, I love this question. I do. I, I struggle with this too, but so the question is, um, this person has an account for their home renovation and decoration page. Do you recommend starting a separate Instagram account as a portfolio? What's your take? I struggle with this one a lot. <laughs> I think this could go one of two ways. Like I think the, the expression here, like the portfolio here is that renovation, that decoration. It's quite literally what we're talking about. Um, however, it could, you could do a supplement. My, my initial thought is you could do a supplemental IG account that, you know, you link somebody to from that home renovation account and say like for my interiors inspiration or for, for my portfolio, go to this, um, you know, go to this page and that, I mean, it depends what your goals are. If your yeah. goal is you know to build up a portfolio and to build up a presence outside of your home renovation maybe that's a good place to do that content dump of your visies or your color or your mood boards or inspiration images alternatively i have seen a lot of success super successful home renovation accounts that blow up so i yeah. think it, it depends on where you want to um place yourself as a designer um and if you have the time, because managing two uh, two Instagram accounts that are both yeah. professional might it's tough, right? Um, but there's I don't think there's a wrong answer here. But I, it, I do think if you're interested in doing a second one, you can talk. You could tag them back and forth. You know your per, your perf, uh, your portfolio page could say you know see my home renovation go here and vice versa. So. Yeah. It, it shows a lot of angles of who you are as a designer, um, which for the average person who's probably not going through a home renovation at this time, um, it's okay if you don't have that. I think one account is great, two account might, might be great too. It just, it's a personal choice, but there's no, I wouldn't say don't do it if you're not into it. You can always try it out too. I mean, I I have my my account, like my Instagram account that is like, semi-personal but mostly my home but then I've, I'm always like should I just keep it home related like are people coming to my page for home or do they just genuinely think that I am like interesting I don't know so I made a separate account for like house stuff so we'll see how it goes but I, I agree it's like not one size fits all it's really just you know what makes sense for your schedule what are you going to keep up with I, I really have a hard time posting on all accounts. So I'm starting to think maybe more than one account isn't the best for me, you know? For sure. I personally have two. I have a private one that's like my personal stuff that's like sometimes design focused, sometimes just like my life. Yeah. And I have my account that we're on, like that's on here now. That's mm -hmm. my business and professional page. And that's worked well for me. Um, you know, initially it was hard for me to toe the line between like what's personal and what's business. And then once I drew the line in the sand, I think I have a clear filter on like what goes on what page and that works for me. Um, but I, I would say definitely the, the professional page is more time consuming. It's, it's, yeah. it's 
more important to me in a, in a certain way because I it, it is it's my portfolio. You know, most people now when they reach out to me and they say, you know, can you send me your portfolio? You know, they will want my IG handle. They'll want my Pinterest page. Sometimes they'll want my you know website or like I a spoke portfolio. Like they want all of the online things. You know, they're not like send me. Yeah. It's like every every piece of it. I know. Well, because it, it really gives people like a good idea of who you are as a designer, and it's different platforms, and you're finding inspiration through different places. So I I feel like that's actually a piece of feedback that you gave me, or it was more a comment, I guess, that on my spoke portfolio I linked out to like everything. I was like yeah. website, Instagram, Pinterest. Like I'm not even on Pinterest All the too much, but. I mean, it's definitely like, why not? You know, I use it a little bit. So show, show people what's on there. Exactly. And, and, you know, on this note, I, I think my final point um, that I want to bring up, and then I think we have a ton of questions to go into is whenever anybody, I think, or including me, when I go to a designer's portfolio, I like to read a little bit about them. Like, a bio, I think, is just like a staple in anybody's CV, in anybody's website or portfolio. So it's interesting to me because you want to understand, okay, visually, this is who this person is. From a, a literal a text content standpoint, like, who, who are they? And, you know, what, what's their background? What, like, what, what makes them so interesting? Because aesthetically, they're very interesting to me. And I have to say, and I think this might go against maybe the norm of what one may assume here is keep, remove the focus from you. Like, remove the, yeah. the way of, like, who Daniela is. And, like, and, and that may sound confusing initially, but I, what I want to say is, like, market yourself as a designer who is open to, like, serving and helping who your prospective client is like your website your portfolio etc should kind of in a way be always be about the future client it should be expressing exactly what you want the future client to know about you so i know we talked we covered this as far as like you know social and like inspiration imagery is concerned with the branding is and the typography and the colors like all of that is a reflection of like the person who doesn't know me, what are they going to learn about me from this page? And kind of look at everything through that filter. Um, because this isn't really explaining to like your family or your friends, like who you are and whatnot. Like it's explaining to your clients, like when they work with you, what, like, what are they going, who are, who are they working with is my point. Like, Right. What, how are you going to help them make decisions? Uh, like, what is, what are you going to bring to the table that is going to benefit their project, their, you know, their, their relationship with you? So when you write your little about or bio page, if you, if you choose to do that, I, I, as Daniela knows, strongly recommend even just a couple sentences. Um, I think you want to take the emphasis away from like all of the personality parts and really talk about your process and maybe talk about the things that matter to you and be like relate and, and be relatable. So the brief bio should be talking about like who you are, why you love design, um, what you love in your spaces. And I think a relatable tidbit about you is important. Um, only if it's speaking the language and like the, and speaking to the kind of client that you want. And, and my, what I mean by this is that I think it's, it's very important to keep relevance at the top of your mind on this, you know, like, how do I explain this? Sorry. I'm, I know it's tricky. Like, I, I, I hear you. Like you may be like a kick-ass baker or something, it, you know, like you maybe run marathons. Like there might be some really interesting part about you that you really want to express. But I think as it comes to your design portfolio, relevance is key. If it's not going to, whatever it is, if it's not going to serve, I think that's the pro tip here that I'm going to put in asterisks is if it's not going to serve the design goal of yours, it's best to leave it out. Whether that's an image or a color or mm -hmm. a tidbit about your life, like, you know, like I'm a mom of 17 dogs. Like 
that's cool. But it, you know, it, it, are you trying to attract the client that is also, you know, an owner of like multiple pets? Like maybe, and that's cool too. Yeah. <laughs> but like, make sure that what you're giving out is you want to attract the same thing back. Um, yeah. So keep relevance at the top of your mind. Like maybe one day you're super attracted to this like neon green and you just love this neon green one day. Like maybe like don't put your whole portfolio in like neon green font because you're just feeling it one day. Like really try to hone through like what is the lens of the client that I'm going to be seeking and what do I want them to know about me and what is important to the found the like the foundation of that relationship because inherently no matter what once you start a relationship with a client they're going to learn things about you they're going to learn that you might be like a mom of four or you know you have 17 dogs or you know you run marathons like two times a year like yeah they're going to learn these things about you because it's a relationship, you know, and, and, and you, you're going, you're going to get personal. So keep the initial um, view of you clear to design. Um, and that's not to say that the people who want to tell everybody everything, if that's who you are, do it. But just re remember that that relevance is important. Um, yeah. And what you're giving to your client, your prospective client up front I think is how they're going to perceive you when making a decision um, because they're going, they're, they're not going to have a conversation with you when they read this, they're going to read this on their own and they're going to process this on their own and they're going to look at your portfolio on their own and then come to you with a request. So think about what you want to convey to your client, prospective clients um, mm -hmm. without being able to speak for yourself, um, without being able to comment or have a conversation about something that they might not like. So that is what I would say on this because I, relevance is, is so missed sometimes um, and people get off topic, like keep it. That's to a good, yeah, that's a good point though. I'm literally, as you're talking about this, I'm thinking about how, I, I am that girl with the, the dog line in my bio. And I'm like, what purpose does this serve me besides the fact that I'm- You love your dog. My dog. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. um, no, but it's like, yeah, I guess I have a question for you then with like the explaining your process or like, I guess, diving a bit deeper into your style. Um, design is so visual. So obviously people can see this in the photos that you have in your portfolio. But when you are doing it in your bio- like how literal or like nitty gritty should you get about your process? You know, like how, I don't know, how much do you want to include without it being like overwhelming, I guess? Because to me, it's like someone can look at my portfolio and literally see like, okay, she loves colors. Like this is what, she, what her style is. But my process is super personal to me. And I, I guess I, have a hard time articulating it sometimes in a bio. So what do you recommend there? I think, well, I think it's very important to speak to who you are as a human, right? Like, I think you interwind like your presence in the community and like who, who you are as a designer in like one or two sentences, you know, like any antidotes that currently to like your dream client, I think also is helpful. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, I've seen so many different bios, ones that are very, you know, straightforward, like, this is who I am. This is where, you know, I, I, I started my career and this is where I am now. Or, you know, I am a designer. I love, I love color and I'm, you know, I'm super organized. And I think those tidbits about you should be concise they should be very clear and they should also be reflective in the in the visual aspect of the portfolio like if you want to say that you're super organized and you love color and then your portfolio is you know all you know gray monochromatic color, like scheme and you know something that seems very abstract and organic it's it maybe is not going to feel like the person that you're saying you are so i just think you, you want to back it up yeah visually. And, and from a content and a text standpoint, excuse me. So they should, they should sing the same song and then maybe a couple sentences. I, I'm, I'm like all about brevity and like really concise, um, direct information about who you are. Um, and it can be, I like color. I really, really organized, or it can be a bit about your process. Like I look forward to working with like, I love to get involved. I don't know. I'm not, I'm like riffing now, but basically like I get involved, 
you know, in the process, you know, here's my step by step. If, but I wouldn't um, give too much away. Yeah. Just tell about yourself. You, I mean, to talk about your process, you could say like, we, we all, we love to start with mood boards and, you right. know, and fluffing pillows. I don't know. I'm just yeah. like, like, but the beginning, things, like a little bit to get a little started, bit, but yeah. like not, yeah, not too, too much. Um, okay. We um, have one good question. I'm sure yeah. you're looking at it now. Yeah. Do you want to read it? Sure. Somebody here is asking, how do you find mentors or people who can help launch your design career if you did not go to design school? And let me tell you, we have in a looking movie, right at her. <laughs> yeah. Looking at us. Um, I would definitely suggest um, if you're not already a member of Spoke, we have an incredible community here. Um, and we also have the opportunity for you to um, get, you know, request time via, you know, paid time via mentors that are within the spoke community. We have a Slack channel um, for, you know, just designer to designer support. I think so great. The, there's so there's a lot of options. Um, but I don't I like what I will say is you do not need to go to design school to have a mentor. Like one of my mentors is the owner of a fabric house. Like she's not a designer, you know, and I think that that is just a relationship that I created um, you know, through reaching out and through interaction and opportunity in networking, like it's organic. Do not feel like if you didn't go to design school, you can't have a mentor. Um, yeah. And I do suggest joining the spoke community to, to get involved in that because we have so many requests for this and yeah. it's super successful for a lot of people. Um, yeah. And it could feel overwhelming too, like going blind, like finding, you're like, how do you even find a mentor? But I think so much of, I mean, spoke for me is like the community element and like the fact that we do have access to people who are able to help us with this. It's so huge. And um, I don't know. It's so worthwhile. I'm going to, we have a couple questions here in the last couple of minutes. Yeah. That were, that, we have like uh, a few minutes someone wrote on, on Instagram a couple of days ago and I wrote them down here. Um, one, one of them is, is it important to, build relationships how important is it to build relationships would you say it's more important than a portfolio and this one i thought similar to the question that we just got is i think it's equally as important and i think there's just different value on them you know like building relationships is is essential and building portfolio is also essential i just think it depends on where you are in your career and you know what your longer term goals are um but it's hard to have it, it sometimes it, it could be a little bit hard to build relationships without a portfolio. And on, on the flip side of that, it, it's not as hard to build a portfolio without relationships. So I think that's part of the impetus of this conversation today is like really figuring out your portfolio is going to give you so much um, content to talk about and to, and to lead with when you are making these connections. Um, because you can, you know, you will be able to say, hey, check out my portfolio, or can I send you my portfolio, or look at my Instagram page. Um, and it will be able, it, that will help you um, articulate yourself to people when you're making a connection. So equally as important, I think that they hold different weight, depending on your perspective, and like where you are, but a portfolio is, I want to say an essential element of being a designer. Like first step, right? You know, first just First, first, step. first step, and it, you don't have to have any. Like I think that's hopefully what anybody's learned that's watching um, today is you don't need to have a ton of clients or any clients to start a portfolio. Yeah, fake it till you make it. That's it. Use what you have. <laughs> exactly. Do you have another one? I think we had a couple more. Um, we yeah, we have a couple in here. Um, let me see. So we have. As a designer yourself, have you ever felt that someone won out a project because of a better portfolio or is it not that big of a factor? A good one. Um, what, loaded question for one minute left. <laughs> of course. I mean, of course. But th the thing is about losing a project is, unfortunately, you never really, unless you ask, you never really know why. You know, it could be it could be a million reasons. It could be someone else's portfolio was better than mine. It could be the relationship was a better fit. It could be their schedule or design fee was a better fit. Um, there's so many elements that go into being awarded a project that it would be hard for me to say that it was like solely somebody else's portfolio right. or experience. Um, 
it, you know, the design industry is a very heavily like relationship based industry. Um, you know, if you like, it's really about the like, it's really about so many factors. Um, so I can't say that I've know that I want, I've lost a project because of my portfolio. Um, but you, I mean, if this is something that's curious, that you're curious about, you can always ask your client and say, you know, thank yeah. you for the opportunity. You know, do you have any feedback? Um, I think that this is something we could definitely talk about in our client yeah. session. Yeah. I do think that it, it's like kind of bridging yeah. both topics right now. Well, maybe that's a good one to end on then anyways. Yeah. We're done, we're done with time. But this has been so much fun. I hope that everyone watching took quite a few things away from it. Um, and I think we covered a ton here, but of course there's the whole like second piece of this, which is clients. So we're gonna have another session um, in the future. So you guys should stick around for that. And thank you for your time, everyone. And Lisa, thank you so much. Thank you, I'll see you guys soon. I hope yeah. you all enjoyed this and I'll see you at the next session. Yeah, let us know if any other questions come up, but there will be part two, so come to that one. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Thanks.